we almost cut it. We almost cut the whole feature, the big daddies and the little sisters, that sort of AI relationship that we created. There was a moment where Ken was like, I think we have to cut this because it's just costing us too much and we're not getting what we need out of it. And he challenged the design team to come up with a replacement for it because it was the marquee feature. It was like the, <laughs> it was the thing that we sold the game idea on. Welcome to Rise Above, an original podcast series by Ascendant Studios, where we share insights and inspirations from industry-leading creators. I'm Tess, the community content manager at Ascendant and your host. After years of being a Twitch streamer, I joined Ascendant Studios to create behind the scenes content about our studio and the games industry. There's so much I love about video games. And now that I'm on the inside, I get to see firsthand how incredible the people are who make them. In this podcast series, I share candid conversations with the talented people I've met from across the industry. We hear their origin stories, the challenges they've experienced, and how they've persevered. Each episode explores how these industry leaders rise above. Today we chat with Paul Helquist, a BAFTA Awards-nominated game designer. He was the lead designer on the original Bioshock, creative director of Borderlands 2, and now leads his own independent studio as co-founder and chief creative officer of Stray Kite Studios. I'm so excited to share Paul's story with you. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us, Paul. It's amazing to have you here. It's amazing to get to talk to you about Stray Kite and about your experience in the industry. You've had a storied career. But let's start kind of at the beginning, if, if you don't mind. What was your relationship with video games as a child? Were your family and friends supportive of your interests? Yeah, so let's see. I, my first gaming memories were, I had a buddy uh, when I was young, first or second grade, I would say, who had an Intellivision. And so when I would go over to his house, we would play on his Intellivision a lot. The two games that I specifically remember were Combat, which was probably the first time I ever played a multiplayer game. And of course, The Empire Strikes Back, you know, we were both big Star Wars fans. And so did a lot of, uh, took down a lot of bad ads in the <laughs> uh, on, on that game. There was an ice cream parlor that we went to that had a, an asteroids cabinet. And then as I got a little bit older, I, I had a next door neighbor who had a ColecoVision. And we had a lot of fun with that. So we ended up getting one of those in our house as well. I played, let's see, Zaxxon was one of the ones I played a lot of. Adventure, which was like a really early RPG adventure kind of game where you were just like a, a circle with a, like an arrow, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they, there was also a really awesome Pac-Man clone that I loved on that machine called Ladybug. Oh, cool. um, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to play Ladybug, but the like different, the different thing that ha uh, was going on there is you could manipulate the maze. There were like these gates. Oh that you could like punch through the wall to oh. like block off the the ghosts. They weren't ghosts, but the other, you know, creatures <laughs> that were coming after you. So you could kind of manipulate the maze as you were eating your little uh your little dots. Uh that was one that I loved as well. Then the next big thing of course was the 8-bit NES. That was around 8th grade for me and I like was begging for that for Christmas and and did end up uh, uh getting it that year. Spent the whole Christmas vacation on Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> and you, you know, you're talking about we're friends and family supportive. Um, my dad, I remember getting a big lecture from my dad that that holiday break because all I did the entire holiday break was was Super Mario. <laughs> And as school was approaching at the end of the week, he was, you know, I got this big lecture about like, you got to make sure you don't, your grades don't suffer because you're playing this thing all the time and stuff like that. And it didn't, uh, everything, everything was fine. And, and from then on, I think, I think they definitely were supportive of that hobby. As I got a little bit older, I moved on to PC in the early nineties playing doom, um, and X wing. I didn't have a machine, but I had a good friend in high school who did. So we would play over at his house. 
And then as I went on to college, I did get a computer for college and, you know, was, was excited to have, uh, you know, a Pentium with a sound card. And it was like, you know, the, the, the big hotness, I thought things wouldn't, wouldn't get much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. So how does your family feel now? Like, are they super happy that yeah. they supported no, it when you were younger? For sure. For sure. They, they were always very supportive when, you know, of me pursuing my passions and over the years at first it was like, so what do you do? How does this work? You know, lots of like not really understanding what, what my role was. And now I think they still kind of don't understand, but are, are like, whatever, it's working out. We, <laughs> we won't bother much about it anymore. <laughs> Very much same <laughs> with my career. I completely get that. You play video games for a living? You interview video game yeah, makers? No, not what? really. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I get the same thing. So you play video games for a living? No, not really. <laughs> You make them, which is literally the coolest thing ever. So how did you actually end up in the video game industry? How did you get started? Did you always want to do that, like ever since you played them as a kid? No, I, I really didn't. It's it's interesting to think about, to you know, to think back on, because it was, you know, as I just described it, uh, you know, uh, very much a pastime for me, but never, you know, in high school, you're like, what am I going to go to college? And what am I going to study? And what am I going to do with my life? Like, that was not on the list. Like, it was not something I was thinking about at all. My passion from a study standpoint at the time was was archaeology. Oh. So I went to college to do anthropology and archaeology. Wow. Um, I went to the University of New Hampshire and studied that for, you know, my whole, my bachelor's degree is in anthropology. So how do how do I get from there to to, to you know yeah. being a designer, right? Well, I was doing archaeology in the summers. Uh, there was a program in New Hampshire that I got connected with, and so I was doing archaeology with them during the summers. And that turned into study opportunities. So um, my senior year, I had to do a thesis for the the honors program, and so I did the like site analysis for for the location that I had dug the previous summer. And so this was a lot of like cataloging artifacts and, um, you know, reading all kinds of papers from around the region to try to figure out where, you know, different materials were coming from and all this, all this kind of stuff. And then I had to write it all up and, and like an academic paper. Right. <laughs> and I, and I did all that and hated it. Like, oh, no. it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, and, and I, and I was writing that up and realizing how I did not like that part of, of the, uh, the field was when I realized like, I, this is, this is what a career in archeology span is. You become a, you know, you go get a PhD doing a lot more of that stuff. And then you become a professor and do even more of that. And, you know, it's, and you get further and further and further away from digging holes, which was the part that I actually loved. So second semester, senior year in college, it was like, cool, now what do I want to do, <laughs> right? Which is, which is not really how it's supposed to go. So I was just like, what else do I, what else am I interested in? I always have followed the philosophy of do what you love and you never work a day in your life, you know that saying? Um, so, so what else do I love? And the next thing on my list was video games. Um, so I got on the internet. This was 1997. It was a very different internet. <laughs> it was there a wasn't, baby. <laughs> yeah, there, there were no pictures on the internet back then. <laughs> God, I, can't even, I, I remember, but it's hard to picture. <laughs> no pictures. Right. Yeah. So I started doing some searches and in the, in the computer labs and at the school and, and found a program at electronic arts called EA Academy. And it was an internship program paid, which was cool, great uh, to be a tester. And they would kind of show you, not only did you test games, but they also kind of showed you a bunch of other little roles, you know, like entry level roles at electronic arts. So I remember not only did I do testing, but I also spent an afternoon in the call center, you know, like listening in on customer support calls and learning how that works and, and things like that. So 
I drove my butt from Massachusetts to San Francisco and, and spent a summer doing testing and learned a ton, did it, did it again the next summer and got a chance to meet some developers. And yeah, it was just an amazing experience that got me started. I uh, got my foot in the door, got to see what game development's really like. That led to level design. Like as I was testing and talking with developers, the level design uh, aspect was what really spoke to me. And so in my off time, I started doing mods. Uh, that was back in the day where that's how you got into the industry. You you grabbed a game like Half-Life and, and you tried to make new content for it. <laughs> I love that game. That's really cool. So you like the more hands-on stuff, clearly. And that's so interesting, digging holes and, you know, sifting dirt for ancient treasures and, and just being hands-on in those kinds of sort of old world places and trying to figure out what the people did and how they lived. That's what anthropology basically is, right? So did those experiences end up influencing your like level design and game design and storytelling practices later on? Yeah, I, I I think it's a really interesting question that I haven't hadn't really thought about until until you brought it up. But I think what where it really helped is in you know what these days in design you call environmental storytelling, which is something that we did uh, you know was a huge part of Bioshock. All of Rapture I like to think of was basically an archaeological site as far as the player was concerned, right? They got there sort of after all of this tragedy had happened and they were unraveling the mystery of, of what was this place and what happened here. And so we did a lot of that back then. And, and it, you know, there's plenty of games still doing it, of course. But through just thoughtful placement of of assets and props and corpses and blood splatters and all of those kinds of things so that you could come into a room and if you were you know some players don't do this but for Bioshock many did they love to just kind of look around and and try to piece together what what happened in those spaces and so I, I do think the archaeology and anthropology background helped me sort of rewind since I've spent time at sites trying to like well if these were here and this is where the fire pit was then you know like where would the houses be they'd probably be a little bit you know over here or whatever like those kinds of things and so you know i think i was able to channel some of that thought process in reverse and and put the things there to tell that story that people can un uncover through through observation which is you know it's really cool i love i love that stuff yeah, that's so amazing that you were able to do that and probably intuitively without even really thinking about it, just based on everything that you had learned, right? Yeah. Bioshock is actually one of my personal favorites from <laughs> ages ago. It's so cool to get to meet the person that created it. It's actually a beloved franchise for so many people. The story, the gameplay, the environments are all so unique and captivating. Is there a part of the game you're most proud of? Yeah, I think for me as a designer, it would be the big daddies and the little sisters, that sort of AI relationship that we created. Now, of course, that wasn't my original idea. That was an idea that Ken Levine had and, and pitched to the design team. They were, this is a little like behind the scenes thing that I enjoy telling people, especially fans, about the original notion All for that all came from nature shows. Ken was telling us how he was watching nature shows and it got him thinking about how the ecology of predators and prey work. And so he was like, his original first sort of pitch to us about this idea was, what if the game had predators and prey? And then what if we added a third, a third piece to that sort of circle that was the protectors who would protect the prey? And so the big daddies, of course, became the protectors. The little sisters were the prey and, and the splicers were, uh, were the predators. And so that was the original concept that he gave to us. And we, you know, we ran with it and developed it. And I think one of the reasons it, it, it connects for me so much is that it's still pretty unique. We're like 15 years past Bioshock at this point. 
and it's a mechanic that no one's really emulated or copied or or you know done the next iteration of which is is very interesting to me because i think it's one of the things that makes that game really work from a mechanic standpoint and why is it so personal to me there was a time in the game where we were we almost cut it we almost cut the whole feature and uh i i remember it wasn't working it wasn't really connecting with players it wasn't you know it didn't feel like it was pulling its weight and it was a very expensive and you know in terms of animation and ai and everything so there was a moment where ken was like i think we have to cut this because it's just costing us too much and we're not getting what we need out of it and he challenged the design team to come up with a replacement for it because it was the marquee feature it was like the <laughs> It was the thing that we sold that game idea on. So if we're going to remove the like most important feature, what are we going to replace it with? And and we went off and pitched a bunch of ideas to him, and none of them really, you know, hit the right notes and was was causing creating the excitement that we were looking for. And I believed that the big daddies and little sisters could work, but we hadn't we hadn't just found the right combination and so after we went through that process i knew i couldn't convince him until we went through the process of coming up with new things so my pitch for the new thing was what i thought was the solve cool. <laughs> for, for the problem okay so after everybody else went and he was like nah 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 what do you have i was like here's how we fix the big daddies and little sisters and i walked him all through it and he was like let's try that because it's actually pretty easy for us to try and you know, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> and all the solve was, was game balance. We, at the time, you could get Adam from lots of different places in the game. And so no one cared about the, the little sisters because, oh, I'm getting about 80% of what I really need. I'm not going to deal with the big boss. I'm not going to, like put so many resources into dealing with with the big daddy to get a little bit more Adam. And so the solve was, what if the little sisters are the only place to get Adam? And so it was, you know, that completely changed the relationship of the player to the big daddies and little sisters. It made the player need them, which they didn't before. It's so incredible that just a balance change, a resource balance change really completely changed things to such a degree to where you could keep the feature and it worked. And that's amazing. Cause that's, I love, I love the big daddies and little sisters. I have a big daddy statue. They're amazing. And that whole interaction for the player is so satisfying with them. And I'm so glad that you guys kept that in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Cool. So that's definitely the, the feature in that game that I'm most proud of, even though, it, you know, it wasn't, I feel I have a, because I kind of saved it, I have a, have this love of it, but it wasn't originally my idea. But okay. since no one's stolen it yet, no one's, <laughs> maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll, yeah. maybe I'll bring them back in some new title. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I am keeping a close eye on all things Stray Kite. <laughs> very, very <laughs> cool. Well, you actually worked on another absolute personal favorite and another absolute fan favorite in Borderlands 2. Right? Amazing game. The, the thing that launched my career definitely is a streamer, actually. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah, it was the main game that I streamed for like the whole first year and a half. And it's it's what started everything. And it's kind of crazy. I love that game so much. That's awesome. Both Bioshock and Borderlands are huge franchises now, right? I mean, they're both incredibly popular even many years later. Lots of people actually still play Borderlands 2 out of all three of the games. That's a lot of people's favorite still although they're all amazing. Looking back, were there any sort of highlight moments during development or even post-development that kind of gave you an inkling of how popular they might get? Yeah, I have a little story for both of those. So for Bioshock, it was a moment during development that happened to me personally. So if you remember the beginning of Bioshock, you, you know, you crash and you go into the lighthouse and you get into the bathosphere and you go under the water and, and there's, you know, this whole sort of sequence of, of going and, you know, coming into the city. 
And man, we had been working on that for like a year and a half, right? Like, and every time I was like, gotta, you know, check out the game. Oh, I gotta watch this. So, you know, so it was like the probably hundredth time I had ridden the bathysphere. But this particular day, the music was added. And suddenly I was getting goosebumps on this thing that I had had ridden and played and seen many, many times, you know, we're getting closer to the end. So a little more bells and whistles in terms of like the fish and the whale and like all of these sorts of things are coming in. But the, the music build up to that, you know, you come over this rise in, in the, on the ocean floor and see the city laid out before you. And, and Gary Scheinman's music just like made me go sit, sit up a little bit from like, okay, whatever. I just got to get through this to get to what I need to test <laughs> to like, whoa, wait a second. This is incredible. Like it, it suddenly hit me how awesome this beginning of the game was going to be. So that was my moment for Bioshock. That was the moment I started to believe I should say. And then when we were in certification time where you're not really allowed to touch anything because it's off to the consoles and they're testing it and you don't want to break anything design team was told just keep playing the game and look for anything that certain might you know that sony might find or that xbox microsoft might find and we just had a, a blast <laughs> like we, we were you know we've been playing forever and but now we could like really just kind of enjoy it and not like i have to get to this particular thing to check on my work or whatever we could just kind of play the game and we just had a great time and everyone was doing weird things and trying different wild strategies. And I think, you know, those two moments for Bioshock. For Borderlands, for me, it was on it was on the first game. I was on the game for about six months towards the end. New at new at Gearbox at the time. And I remember getting an email from one of the programmers who was like a, a build engineer or something. He he wasn't like oh yeah, I made the weapon system or I worked on this enemy or something like that. He was like, I make sure that everyone in the studio gets the builds and they download properly and like, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, support guy. And he sent an email to us one day towards the end of the game of the project to the design team in particular and was like, I had to do such and such a thing and in order to check it, I needed to fire up the game after I did it. And he said, so I started playing. I was enjoying myself. And then my wife came into the room and said, what are you doing? And, I, and he said, I'm playing, I'm playing Borderlands. And she was like, it's morning. <laughs> and he was like, what? And he, he was doing work <laughs> and ended up playing the game all night. <laughs> just got involved and then joined himself and, and ended up playing the game all night when he was supposed to just check whatever he was doing real quick. And he ended up, you know, playing the game all night long. <laughs> and so that was a, an amazing story, especially from a fellow developer to, to hear and, and started getting me to think like, man, if it can do that to somebody who's, you know, knows the game already and, you know, who knows what this could do, you know, when fans, of this kind of game really get their hands on it. So, and it's great to hear stories like yours, you know, of, of streaming it and stuff. That's amazing. <laughs> funny, funny that you mentioned that and funny that that story happened. It's amazing to hear that. I absolutely understand how he felt because my very first 24 hour stream which was like the thing you do when you first start streaming. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's very daunting because you're talking, you're not just like, I mean, we've all done play sessions, sessions for that amount of time, but Talking and being entertaining for that long is a little bit tough. And I had this whole yeah, plan. Sure. I was going to play Borderlands 2 at the start, and I was going to play some scary games later to like wake myself up. And then I was going to play some more Borderlands 2 later and some other games. I, I literally didn't even look at anything else for the entire 24 hours. I just played Borderlands 2 the whole time. I played by myself. I played with friends. It was just such a good time. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So... You've done so many incredible things in your career. You've gone from QA tester to level designer to lead designer to creative director and beyond now leading a company in Stray Kite. Was there anything you observed kind of early in your career that stuck with you so much that you has swayed your decisions now as a leader? 
Yeah, I think that moment for me was GDC 2004, 2005, somewhere in that range. It was the first GDC that I had ever gone to. Um, even though I'd been in, you know, making games for five or six years by then, it was the first chance I got to go to, to GDC. And I took this um, game design workshop that was like an all day thing. They, they don't really do those anymore. But it was like an all-day thing. It was run by a designer who I had some sort of secondary connections to named Mark LeBlanc. Um, he used to work at, at Looking Glass Studios, and a lot of the folks at Irrational you know, were former Looking Glass folks. So I kind of secondhand had a, had sort of a connection. And so I was really excited to, to see what this was all about and, and learned so much. And he eventually got around to this idea for a methodology for how to think about your game design. And it was called, it's called the NDA methodology, which stands for Mechanics, Dynamics, and Aesthetics. And the notion is that when you're designing a game, you create mechanics, the rules of your game. And the rules, depending on the rules you make, it creates dynamics in how people interact with the, with the game and how they, how they think about the game and how they progress through it and how they end up playing it. And the way they play then creates aesthetics, which are emotions. How do you feel when you're playing the game because of those dynamics? And the notion that he presented that I still use in every single game I make is if you take your game idea, the next thing you should do is how do you want players to feel? So you've got your, your high-level idea of, uh, you know, a, a game that's a cross between Halo and Diablo. That was the original pitch for Borderlands. Okay, that's, that sounds cool. Yeah, let's do that. What's that going to be? Then how should the player feel while they're playing it? And so that's the emotions the player it feels. For To go back to Bioshock, I came back from that talk. We were working on Bioshock. I was like, we haven't figured out what our core aesthetics are what we want players to feel. So we got the design team together and okay, what we know what we're making. Let's let's actually boil that down to what are those feelings that we're trying to evoke from the player. And so we we had a little mnemonic. It was called I see ham. <laughs> and the I was for immersed. The C was for curious. H was hungry. <laughs> Hungry, not in a food nom nom, but in a like, oh my gosh, resources. I need, I need Eve. I need health. I need bullets. I know, oh gosh, how, how am I going to survive? Uh, a was afraid, and M was meaningful choices. That was a bit of a stretch, not really an emotion, but it was a you know a core notion to the game that that every decision you make should have be high impact, and so. You know, hopefully as a fan of Bioshock and, and hopefully the listeners too who have played will will go, Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much how I felt when I was playing that <laughs> playing that game, right? Exactly. <laughs> as you were saying it, I was like, Yep, yep, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so so that was a huge takeaway from in my early career from that uh, GDC talk. And every single game I make have made since and continue to make the first things we do is we get that high level like what what's the you know this core idea and then how should the player feel and then as you're developing that drives everything when we were deciding what features to keep and what features to cut on say bioshock as we were running out of time and we can't get everything done well which one affects those core mechanics more which one which one hits more than one? Like if there's something that's like, man, this is amazing for fear, but doesn't add to immersion or curiosity or et cetera. Well, I guess that one will have to go. But this one hits three or four of them. So that's a really important feature and, and is, you know, uh, very important. And it also helps us evaluate the game. Like there was a time in Bioshock where we were like, we're doing great on immersed and curious and hungry, but no one's afraid. And so we had like, a month where all the designers only goal was to make the game creepier and more unsettling. <laughs> you guys were very successful. 
<laughs> I played, uh, I've always played almost since the very start with a heart rate monitor and it was very high for a lot of those moments. Oh. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. These days you can, we can, we can uh, get some data on that sort of stuff. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's been a huge, a huge part of how I think I design, how I, you know, uh, you know, try to teach my newer designers to think about games and, mm -hmm. And ultimately, you know, it's about the player and how do we want them to feel. So cool. It's it's so interesting how you kind of work backwards from like feelings and situations and things like that. So interesting. Right. Yeah. Once you have the core idea and you have your aesthetics, then like he said, you will kind of work backwards and like, well, what what mechanics will we put in that will drive people, you know, towards, you know, the end goal, whichever it may be. So simple one is hungry. Well, that's that's relatively easy. The mechanic is resource scarcity. Like, just don't give them as much as they feel they need, and they'll feel hungry, right? Um, so so interesting. There's so much psychology that goes into, or just like understanding of human beings, which I guess is psychology. But it's just so interesting <laughs> how all of that plays in to video game making. It's amazing. I know that game design and development can be insanely challenging. I've seen that with our Ascendant devs. I've seen that with the devs I worked with before I joined. I've just seen that across the board in my entire career and even before I ever thought of it as a career. <laughs> Through all of your projects, do you remember like a greatest challenge that you faced and how did you solve it? Man, yeah. I mean, I've dealt with been doing it for over 20 years and man have games changed since since the late 90s so i've i've done a little bit of everything i remember trying like hell to get a game to fit into the memory on the playstation 2 so that was the technical kind of challenge and then you have creative challenges like we spent a ton of time on bioshock with what should rapture look like and it took us a long time to to land where we did and so that was very challenging when we were in that like, eh, no, it still doesn't feel right. Not this, try another thing. And then, you know, these days games have gotten so big and they take more than one studio. And how do you coordinate with co-development partners and outsourcing partners? And like, so that becomes more of a production and organization kind of challenge. But I think when I think back on my career, the one that was the the biggest for me, I think, was was Borderlands 2, because that was the first time that I was the creative project lead. Like, I was the guy that everyone was looking for, for the answer to literally any question about how the game should feel or, or play or look or whatever. Like, I was the final, the final say, and that was a new experience for me. And so I learned a ton about how to give feedback, how to listen to feedback, because it went both ways. I, my job was a lot of giving feedback, but I always had people stomping into my office and being like, the doll weapons suck. I, they're so bad. Why are they even in the game? And, you know, things like that would, would, would come up and I'd have to like, OK, what do you let me let me understand. Let me listen. And, and, and you know, let's think about what we can do. And sometimes the answer, which is, doesn't make people happy, is they're exactly what they need to be. And I'm sorry you don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> but there's six other weapon manufacturers you can enjoy. <laughs> you know, maybe they're not for you. So, and, and, and that can be hard as well to find the right way to give that kind of information to people. It was interesting for me, uh, you know, being that guy on Borderlands 2, I was not that guy on Bioshock. I started to have a much better appreciation for the kinds of things that that Ken was dealing with when when we were working on that game, and so it gave me a better perspective on that whole development cycle and and that part of my career, which was pretty pretty interesting. And you know, those are all of those lessons are things that I'm still using every single day. And now I'm helping lead an entire studio, so it's you know just ramped up a little bit more, right? But uh, yeah, that that's so. I think that's what I would go with for that one. So amazing! I mean, you gain experience as you as you grow, but it, there's always new challenges, right? And it sounds like you sort of not only persevered through them, but always took lessons along. It's so cool. Yeah, I try to. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all try to. Yeah, and it's amazing when you can. 
So now that you're leading Stray Kite Studios, which is so incredible, it's an independent game studio working on some very exciting projects. Maybe you'll be able to tell us a little bit about that later. What are some team practices you feel are absolutely essential? Are there any that you try to steer your team away from, things you try to lead them towards? Yeah, yeah, we think about this a lot. And my partner, Shovan Patel, and I, when we first founded the company, talked about this a lot when it was just the two of us. Like, what do we want this place to actually be like? What do, you know, what do we want it to feel like to work there? What do we want to promote? Exactly your question. So probably the two biggest things that we're, we, you know, try to live every single day and encourage our people to as well is the notion is trust and psychological safety. So we feel that everyone does their best work when they're entrusted to tackle problems and 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 empowered to to resolve those problems. We try very hard and it can be difficult when you're a leader to let people solve problems in the way that works best for them. Like, you know, there's there's some self-reflection of like, that's not how I would do it. But if it solves the problem and, and achieves the goals, it's, you know, let's let people, you know, do, do things in the way that works best for them. So that's, that's something that we, we try to do all the time. And then psychological safety is this concept that we came across from an article that we read from Google. So Google did this really, you know, they have zillions of dollars to spend on these sorts of things. They did a, they did a research, internal research project to find out what made a team successful or not. And the only thing that they found after studying their teams for like three years was that psychological safety equals success and every other factor that they thought would matter didn't matter at all. So what's psychological safety? It's the notion that the ability to speak your mind without fear of uh, reprimand or ridicule from your team is the single most important thing to get teams to be successful. And so this allows them to explore many different options, different perspectives, and, and find solutions that you know, that don't even get considered if people don't feel uh, free to speak their mind because they're worried that they'll get shouted down or, you know, brushed off or, or, or whatever. So that's something that we try to promote a lot at Straight Kite as well. Oh, another notion that, that we talk a lot about is what, what we call, we want an environment of no surprises is what we say. Because Game development happens rapidly and stuff happens all the time. And we find that you generally are in a worse situation if you're caught off guard by, by something. And that might be like, you know, hey, the game, we're, I can tell by how we're building the game that we're headed towards a problem that's going to happen in the future. Like we want people to raise their hands and wave those flags as soon as they possibly see those kinds of things so that we aren't like, where did this come from? And someone's like, well, I kind of saw this coming a month or two ago. Like that doesn't help anyone. So we talk a lot about raising flags quickly, bringing up, you know, issues with coworkers. Like we just, it's important to just be free and open and talk about things. And this even, you know, I talked about like bad things that might creep up and grab you, but we also don't want happy surprises. We don't want somebody like, oh, I'm working on this really awesome feature, but I'm doing it in secret and I'll, I'll only talk about it when, when it's ready. Like, we don't like that either. We'd rather have someone be like, I have this really cool idea. You know, I'd like to explore it. And then we can like, okay, cool. Let's find some time. Let's, you know, let's account for that. And, and then everyone's even more excited when, when those little skunk works things pay off. Um, so those are the, some of the things that we, we try to do here at Straight Kite. So cool. That's very, very smart. And I, I totally agree with you. When you when you can speak freely, it's a really nice feeling to like just have that trust, right? So Straight Kite Studios has done a ton of really cool things already. You guys have published many mini games through Fortnite Creative, for example, including the original Prop Hunt and other featured islands. So cool. What has your experience been like working within a platform like Fortnite Creative? How do you approach that? 
Yeah, Fortnite and we had uh, was was huge for us. It was um, the first work that we got to do as a studio. We were fortunate enough to work directly with Epic in their code base. We were help at the time we were helping just like get creative off the ground. And as you know, once it launched, they asked us to start um, what they called dog fooding which was, hey, we're building all these things for uh, you know the community to make games out of. Why don't you guys see what it can do as it's, you know, like kind of a, a preview almost. Like we were building things a little bit ahead of, of, you know, before they were released and could, you know, could make changes and stuff because we were in their, in their code base. So we can make them more user friendly or add new, new elements or features. And so that, you know, helped us, you know, get going with those islands. And it was really fun. What I, what I thought was really cool, it sort of brought me back to my roots because it felt very much like modding where you've got a, a tool set. Like I was, a, as a modder, I was not an engineer. I'm not a programmer. So I just had to take whatever already existed and find fun new ways to recombine them and, and, and cre create a new experience. And that's a lot what uh, creating islands for, for Fortnite creative mode is like, is, hmm, well, I've got this and that. Maybe if I use them in this way, I can get, a, you know, get something that's a little bit different than maybe what they were originally intended for and, you know, find creative ways to, to recombine things into, into new, new gameplay experiences. And so that's, that's really what it felt like working in creative. And, and that was a fun time for sure. That sounds so interesting and cool. I mean, working with a tool that you're sort of new to that's limiting in some ways, but it like inspires creative ways to solve problems in other ways is so interesting, right? So going back to game design, because I mean, that's that's basically been your thing from the beginning, right? That's what you loved. And even with whatever tool you're using, that's what you're doing. Is there one sort of thing in game design, one element that you feel is absolutely vital for like 99% of games? Yeah, that's a really tough one because I feel like, you know, games are so broad and, and, and everyone can be so different that it's hard for me to say like, if you don't do this in your game, it's, you know, it's going to fall apart. But for me, when I'm thinking about the games that I'm working on, it, it does always come back to those core aesthetics that I talked about a few minutes ago. You know, are we creating the emotions that we're trying to achieve? And if not, it's time to to analyze like how are we missing on on those, and how can we do better there? And then, you know, another thing that kind of go back to, to what we talked about a little bit earlier, but it's amazing to me how often, like the story with the big daddies and little sisters, a major issue in your game might be as simple as, as the, the balance of the numbers. Like, and, and so that's always the first place I start if something's really not working is like, well, let's just change the, no the balance numbers and, and see how the game feels after that. And it's usually pretty easy. <laughs> it's pretty fast. You can you can get a quick turnaround to see if it's like a is it the feature itself or is it just that we picked numbers that don't really you know highlight things. And so the first thing I do is like crank it way up or crank it way down. And so in the, that example of Adam, it was like instead of it being everywhere, what if it's only from one location? And that you know sort of cranked it way down, and now it suddenly feels very different. Sometimes it might be like, oh, this weapon's stupid. We should just cut it. And it's like, well, 10x its damage and then see if people have fun with it, right? Like sometimes it can be as small as that to be like, whoa, actually, okay, it's not the concept that's wrong. It's that the numbers were too conservative. And so it never felt entertaining or powerful or exciting or whatever you were going for. And then, yeah, and then you turn some more knobs around it. If that's fun, then you start turning other knobs around it to account for, if you're like, okay, this is really powerful now, so maybe we ought to turn some of these other things down. And, you know, so that's kind of where I always start is start with the numbers if something's not working and, and be thinking about those emotions. What are you trying to achieve? This explains quite a few weapons in Borderlands 2. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. Especially those legendary ones. Let's just crank that up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Why not go to the extreme? It's a good time, right? That's really, yep. really cool. Yep. It's so interesting to talk with you and have this view into into the, the mind behind some of those amazing experiences that I've had with those games. Thank you. Talking about sort of skills and, and things that you've learned along the way, is there a skill that you didn't have, but maybe you wish you had picked up that would have like benefited your game dev experience and journey? Yeah, I think I think right now in my career, I wish I could draw. <laughs> I you know I like sometimes it can be hard to find the right words, or you have this picture in your head of exactly how you want something to feel or look or whatever, and I have to just fumble through with words on the on paper or you know talking with somebody. Whereas I'll work with these amazing artists, and they'll have an idea. And they'll scribble for like five seconds and you're like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's, looks, that sounds amazing. Let's go do it. So I wish I had that tool in my toolbox to help communicate ideas to, to people faster than, than sometimes, you know, sometimes it's like we got to do a lot of iterations because I just don't have the right words. Whereas those artists can just, do a quick sketch and and you know exactly what you're where you're headed. So that's one that I wish I had now. When I was a level designer, it was 3D modeling. I was a level designer right in the transition from like Unreal Engine 2, which was all uh, what they call BSP. There wasn't a whole lot of art in the levels. It was all this uh, you know very primitive like shapes and stuff like that. And then Unreal Engine 3 was the move for to static mesh, which is what everything is these days, you know, or 3D modelers go into Studio Max and make amazing things and, and then you place them into the world. That was something that I was right on that transition and wanted to be able to make my own meshes for the levels and just didn't didn't have the skills in the background in order to do it. I, I dabbled, but never really uh, never really had the time to to get into that as much as as I had wished. So if someone's new, 3D modeling I think is a great thing if you're also want to be, be a level designer. But yeah, go to art school. <laughs> I guess is my <laughs> I guess that's what it comes down to. Even if you want to be a designer, it can't hurt to go to art school or at least take some art classes. <laughs> very fair. <laughs> very, very fair. I know that feeling that you mentioned where you're like the ideas in your head and you just don't know how to verbalize it. My problem is I can't draw it either. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the, what happens to me is I'm like, oh, I'll just I'll just do that thing that the artists do, and I like <laughs> scribble for a little bit, and I'm just like, oh my god, and everyone else is like, what the hell is that? You know, it's like playing Pictionary with your kids or something. It's like that's that's not a horse. What is that? You know, like <laughs> it's still fun to try. And obviously you've been very, very effective because you've made some incredible <laughs> games and incredible experiences for people. Can you think of a time in your career when a more experienced dev kind of took you under their wing, gave you good advice or inspired you in some way? Oh, for sure. Yeah. This has happened many times. You know, at Irrational Games on Bioshock, I, you know, I got to work with some extremely talented folks who had, had made, you know, all these awesome games, like I said, uh, when they were originally at Looking Glass. So games like Thief, The Dark Project, the original Thief game, um, and System Shock 2, lots of alumni from both of those games that I learned a ton from. Of course, learned a lot from Ken Levine. From him, uh, a lot of the takeaways that I still think about were around storytelling and uh, integrating narrative and design into a harmonious, you know, come together and be this wonderful experience. Another mentor from Irrational is a guy named Dorian Hart. He was a balance designer, so had a very strong head for math. And so he taught me a lot about some of those things we were talking about before about, hey, if you're trying to balance something like start with the extremes and, you know, and then start dialing it in and, you know, how, how different like 
math concepts can affect balance and all those kinds of things that which uh, you know I I've learned a ton from him on that. And then probably the best single piece of advice I ever got was when I was at Electronic Arts I was doing testing and I got a chance to spend a little time with one of the love designers on the game I was testing. It was a game called Future Cop LAPD for the original PlayStation. And I gave him some feedback on, on one of the levels that he was working on. And, and we, you know, kind of became a little bit friendly for a little while. And he took me to lunch one day and I was like, look, I want to do what you want, what you do. Like I've been working and, you know, making some maps in Quake, some deathmatch stuff, you know, like any advice. And, and he said to me, and I'm so sad. I can't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to find him and I couldn't. He said, you got to make single player content. So this was 98, 99. And at the time there weren't like multiplayer only games like Apex and, you know, Fortnite and stuff like that. So it was, it was like games at that time were like single player experiences. Even your shooter games were mostly about single player. So he was like, you got to make single player stuff if you want to get a job because the deathmatch stuff is sort of a is a is a secondary like even when you're making the game he was like the deathmatch maps are on your spare time because <laughs> the single player is 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 the where the majority of the work was and that was a huge piece of advice and i immediately stopped working on multiplayer stuff and went, the next thing i made was a like 45 minute half life adventure which got me my job at irrational so that was a huge piece of advice. Well, maybe somewhere out there, that person is listening to our podcast. Or yeah, watching on that YouTube. would be amazing. Let so, us know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> maybe this is how you find them. <laughs> that would be yeah. cool. With all of your amazing experience, do you have any advice for aspiring game designers, developers, people hoping to get into the industry? Yeah, I get this question all the time and I always feel like my answer is really lame. So <laughs> hopefully people will get some value out of it. So what I always tell people, especially people who want to be designers, like if they're interested in programming or art, there's really obvious, great places to go get the skills you need uh, in order to be successful in those. those. But design is still really hard to, to know where what to do, where to go to school, does the school matter? Like I get those questions all the time. For me, I always tell people to make games. So that can be board games, that can be running your Dungeons and Dragons game as the game master is, you're definitely a game designer if you're running, <laughs> you're running D&D uh, &D campaigns. Grab the, you know, latest, uh, free versions of Unreal or Unity or whatever you like to to explore and and just start trying to put things together and get a feel for what it's like. So that's that's the one thing, and then and then jam your foot in the door, like search for opportunities far and wide. Jam your foot in the door, and once you're in there, make yourself indispensable. Be the person who's willing to like. You know, if you hear the like, man, if only we had someone who could spend some time doing blank, blank, raise your hand and be like, I'll figure it out. Right. And, you know, when you're when you're in those junior positions, putting yourself out there, being willing to learn and and shine is going to get you noticed by your coworkers. And, and, you know, pretty soon you'll be, you know, in charge of a major part part of a game. So that's that's kind of how I tell people to do it. Thank you so much. I think that is not at all lame in any way, shape, or form. It's very good advice. Thank you. Just for fun, does your love of hockey have any influence on your work? Yes, I am a big hockey fan. You know, enjoy watching it on TV, but I also play. I am a goaltender. I have a game tonight at 7. Excited about that. Okay. And I actually play on a team that was started by my lead programmer here at Straight Kite. And he realized that there are, you know, a bunch of developers in Dallas and a lot of us like to play hockey. So he like called around and, and it's essentially a game that was, that's a bunch of game development. So we've got <laughs> folks on the team from Straight Kite, id Software, Gearbox. Uh, we have a guy from Cloud Chamber as well. 
and you'll get a kick out of this because you're in development as well. But our, our team name is called the Feature Creeps. <laughs> <laughs> so, good. Uh, um, so yeah i i'm a big fan what has that brought to game you know my career you know obviously it's a it's a team sport you all do do better if you all work together so that's kind of the obvious you know example but for me it's mostly been a a, a mental health outlet a way for me to get out of the house, get more, get off of the chair and get some exercise. So that's good for your mental and physical well-being. Social outlet with, with other players, which is great. And, you know, even when uh, development has been overwhelming, by uh, Borderlands 2 being one time that I was just, I was going to the brink, like, for a long, long time, but I always made time for, for hockey and it gave me a way to, you know, get my head out of the game for a little while and focus on something else. And, and so it's really helped me, you know, try to stay more well balanced with work life. So that's, that's what it's done for me. That's so important. So what is Stray Kite up to these days? Is there anything you kind of want to share with the audience? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks so much, you know, for giving me the opportunity to come talk to, to you guys. It's always fun to connect with another developer as well. Um, so Stray Kite, we are excited that we are approaching our fifth year anniversary. Yeah, we were founded in my beginning of April 2018. So we're, we're coming right up on it. And uh, so that's exciting. We're we're getting back into an office space soon. We you know we we that went away like everyone for everyone else in pandemic times. And uh, you know we're now in a place where we feel that it's it's safe and and our employees are looking looking for that social connection with their teammates more. So that's exciting coming down the line. And we are working on a, a pretty exciting project. I unfortunately can't talk about it yet because it's not announced. But that should be announced in the next couple of months. So I encourage everyone to follow us on your favorite social networks and, and keep your eyes and ears open. Thank you so much. Seriously, Paul, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you for sharing your amazing story. Thank you for making, seriously, some of my favorite games of all time and many, many people's favorite games. And I'm very excited and I'm sure lots of people will be very excited to see whatever Stray Kite and you are up to next. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Rise Above. We look forward to bringing you more insider conversations with game industry leaders. If you enjoyed the listen, we'd love for you to rate and review the show. It helps so much. Please subscribe for future episodes. Check out our website at AscendantStudios.com to keep up with the game we're making and find us on all socials as Ascendant Studios. You can also sub to our newsletter, The Stand Up, to get bonus insights from the developers we talk to on this show and more. We'll be back soon with more insightful, one-of-a-kind conversations with some of the most experienced and successful game devs in the world. For now, this is Tess, signing off.